Let us welcome Miss Zhang Tingjun. Hi. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Okay. Very glam, right? My picture. Actually, when they chose this picture and they sent it to me, they were like, is this picture okay? I was like, yeah, it's okay, but you know, I don't really look like that on a daily basis, you know. But anyway, uh, my name is Ting, um, and as you've heard, I'm one of the co-founders of the Chain Reaction Project. My teammate Alex is also here in the audience today. Uh, and what I'm going to do really is, um, in the interest of time as well, is just to tell you a little bit about my life uh, and my story and how I came to find myself in this position now, um, doing what I love with the Chain Reaction Project. And hopefully, um, a little bit of what I share resonates with you guys, inspires you guys on some level, uh, and if not, then I hope you just enjoy the story either way. All right, so um, the story starts, they told me I could point this anywhere and there was a very powerful clicker that, whoa, works. There we go. Okay, so the story really starts here. Now, you know, yeah, I'm here today and I'm supposed to be a leader and this and that. But, I, I, you know, when I was a kid, um, I was definitely not one of those born natural leaders. In fact, when I was in primary school, um, you know, I had no friends and, and nobody wanted to be my friend. Uh, in fact, it was so bad that, um, you know, I had to strategize. So I said to myself, okay, if I have no friends in primary school, then I need to target the two most popular girls in school. So if they're my friend, then you know, everybody else will follow suit, and that way I don't have to go tackle one by one by one, right? So I went up to these two girls, I still remember their names, Geraldine and Charme uh, Charlene. So I said, oh, Geraldine, is there a Geraldine here? Not, 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 not you, huh? you're a bit young. Okay? But the Geraldine and Charlene, I said, like, hey guys, you know, can I be your friend? And so they said, oh no, you know, uh, well, let me think about it. And then they came back to me. They said, okay, I'll tell you what, you know, we're, we're quite generous, lah, okay? Uh, we're going to run a test for you. And if you can pass the test, then you can be our friend. So I was like, wow, test. But I said, okay, never mind, never mind. I'm quite good at these things, you know. I was like, okay, come, we bring it on, right? What, what is the test? So they said, okay, we're going to leave all these clues. And each clue will lead to the, next, to the next clue. And if you can collect all the clues, then at the end of it, then you can be our friend. So I was like, okay, you know, this kind of game, I think should be all right. So the first clue was, okay, the next clue was located outside the teacher's staff room at the top of this like, hill you have to climb and then hidden behind this plant. And it's very dangerous because it's right outside the teacher's staff room and that's the part you're not supposed to climb. But I was like, never mind, for the sake of friends, I'll climb. So, you know, I waited until everyone was kind of distracted. I climbed, I found a clue, it took me to the next clue, and finally I was down to the last clue. And the last clue was at the highest point of the playground. It was supposed to be that final clue. So I said, like, okay, I can do this, you know. And back then in my primary school, there were two playgrounds. One was the normal one with the monkey bars and all that, and then another one at the back of the school that I don't even know what kind of playground. It's like a lot of wooden poles, but they call it a playground also. Anyway, so I figured it's probably, you know, I checked the first one, it wasn't there. So then I headed, you know, to the one at the back. And sure enough, you know, I climbed right to the top, at the top of the beam, and I was like feeling at the top, and there was, there was nothing. So I came back down, you know, and I went to, to Geraldine and to Charlene, and I said, oh, you know, I've, I've looked everywhere, you know, but I can't find the last clue. And then they were like, oh, hmm, sorry, I, I guess the wind must have blown it away. And I said, like, huh, then how? Then they're like, oh, then you fail. They're like, fail. And then I'm like, then they're like, then you cannot be our friend. So I was like, ah, oh, cannot be our friend. I was like, you know, the injustice of it all. But anyway, my, my point really was that I think ever since primary school, um, and that, oh, I found out later, you know, I was actually public enemy number two. It wasn't even just that I had no friends. It gets worse. But my point is that, you know, I think ever since primary school, I've always felt this sense of, um, I guess, the need to fight for the underdog, um, or to stand up for people who are being bullied. Um, you know, it, 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 it does suck, you know, when you find yourself in, in that position. I guess having been there, you know, um, that was a lesson for me that, that did shape me early on. And then growing up, um, that's me. Anybody here from MGS? No MGS? One hand, one girl from MGS is only two? Where's everybody else, guys? Where's all my homies? No, three? Four? Hey, you don't be shy. If you're from Andrews, just be proud, guys. Come on. Yeah, I, that one, 
Five? Okay, we'll work with that. But anyway, I went on to MGS, um, and things were much better there, you know. But the thing is, I was just never very focused in school. So even in, in kindergarten, I, I jumped out of the school bus window on the way to school so I wouldn't have to go. My mother would have to drag me in my pajamas and leave me outside the school gates to change into my uniform and not let me back in the car so I would go to school. You know, and in MGS, while I was going to school, I still I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And because of that, I just wasn't very focused. I wasn't very motivated. Uh, and I ended up doing my old levels twice. Um, because the first time I did it, it was just so many points. I was like, uh-oh. So my mom was like, you do it again. I was like, that's weird. Nobody does their O-levels twice. She's like, that's not the point. Do it again. Um, you know, and then, but throughout, I think, my schooling career, while I didn't know what to do with my life, with myself, I wasn't motivated in my studies. One thing that I did focus on a lot and I was very passionate about was netball, was my sport. Um, and eventually, I ended up playing for the national team and, and played for a long time with uh, many close friends on that team. Um, at the same time, um, made it through, somehow graduated from college, and then I thought to myself, okay, now, why are you laughing at my face or my mom? Why? <laughs> my dad? <gasps> well, eh, okay, what? Anyway, so these are my parents, and yes, so I finally graduated from college, and then I thought to myself, okay, you know, what am I going to do with my life now that I've graduated? You know, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I want to give back, I want to make a difference, but at the same time, you know, I guess all these years of playing netball at such a competitive level, I wanted something that, you know, was also kind of adrenaline pumping. I said, okay, you know what? I want to be a helicopter paramedic. Cool, huh? Yeah, that's not me, lah, huh? I, I, I ended up coming back to Singapore and working at Standard Chartered Bank. You know, you just never know what life is going to throw at you. Um, but honestly, you know, for me, I wanted to be a helicopter paramedic. I wanted to give back, you know, but that's not exactly how life played out. And when I came back to Singapore, I said, now what? I still don't know what I'm going to do, and I'm clearly not a helicopter paramedic. So I thought, okay, at least if I work in a bank, maybe I can rotate through the divisions until I figure out what I want to do. Maybe I do marketing, maybe I go to HR, maybe, you know, and so I thought, maybe I should just start there. And I ended up doing events and marketing at Standard Chartered Bank for two years. Um, and during that time, I learned a lot, but I still felt very restless, and I was like, ugh, I still don't know. I don't think this is it. And then when I was at Channel News Asia, uh, sorry, when I was at Stanchart, I was doing a lot of hosting for events because the budgets, anybody, no, none of you are from Stanchart, right? You're like kids, right? That's fine. So the budget was always very small in the bank. So they said, you know, you go and run the event, but your budget is very small. So I was like, oh, how like that? So I used to host all the events to save money, right? And I thought, oh, maybe I should just go and be a TV host then. So I said, okay, where shall I go? Channel 5, Channel 8, you know? And then I said, then I had, I had a friend who was like, no, no, why don't you apply to Channel News Asia? And I was like, okay, I guess it's still TV, right? And then I found myself, honestly, at Channel News Asia. So I applied. Why, guys? I thought I looked quite nice in this picture. Why? This is not Photoshop. I like that. You all are. Anyway, so I found myself at Channel News Asia. And, you know, while I was there, um, you know, this, it actually ironically fed into my desire to get back even more. Because when you're working in a newsroom, for example, and let's say you're in charge of writing a story for the five o'clock news, and you're in charge of writing about a flood, let's say in the Philippines. At the seven o'clock news, the eight o'clock, chances are you're the same writer that's gonna to have to update the figures of that story and update the story. And in Asia, we have so many natural disasters that often I would find myself writing stories um, on a natural disaster in the area, cutting the sound bites of mothers who are crying because they lost their children and death tolls that would just rise by the hour, you know? And I just really felt like there was more that I wanted to do, but I didn't know what that looked like. Until 2009, um, when I found myself, quite interestingly enough, um, in Timor-Leste. 2009 was the year that I stopped playing netball for Singapore um, and had this very big boy, void, a very vid, big void is what I'm trying to say. But there was this very big void. If any of you play on a team or you're part of a theater group, you know when the game is over or that huge season or tournament is over, that feeling after that when you're not sure what to do with yourself. Um, and that's how I felt. And a friend came to me and said, hey, would you like to take part in the Tour de Timor? And I was like, ooh, what's that? Uh, and it was this 450 kilometer mountain bike race through nine of Timor-Leste's 13 districts. 
And I said, you know what? That sounds like the perfect adventure. There had been assassination attempts on the president. Timor's had a very turbulent history. And I thought, well, how exciting to ride through a country like that. And when I came together with my teammates, at first, it was to discuss who would bring the clothes pack, you know, who was going to bring the tents and things like that. But the more that we talked about the race, the symbolism of the race for a country that was trying to get back into the media but for the right reasons, the Tour de Timor was a ride for peace, the more we said to ourselves, maybe we can use this adventure to do more than just race and take pictures. And we said, you know, let's see what we can do to use this adventure as a platform to raise funds and awareness for Timor Leste and also specifically for a cause on the ground that resonated with the team. And this is my team here. None of us had any of experience in the nonprofit sector, in fundraising, none of that. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, but we felt very, very moved by our experience in Timor Leste, the people that we met, um, and Hiam Health specifically, which is the first charity partner that we worked with, and Rosaria Martins de Cruz, who is the Timorese director of the center. And I remember at the end of this first initiative, uh, when we raised about $50,000 uh, for Hiam Health, and she said to us, you know, with tears rolling down her, her cheeks and her face, and she said, I want my people, you know, I want my country to be like your country. I want my people to be like your people, healthy in their bodies, happy in their faces. And I said to myself, you know, we've got to do something more than just this one race. You know, we might not be there in the trenches fighting alongside Rosaria, but we can do something back home. And so we came back to Singapore, and fortunately there were a lot of people who were interested as well and said, where are you guys going next? Can we be a part of this? Is it another adventure? Is it back in Timor? And this was an excellent platform to teach people about Timor Leste and about Hiam Health and that cause. And so we came back to Singapore, went back to Timor again in 2010, and then we found ourselves on our next trip, our next trip, our next trip. Um, and so it continued, and now we work with schools, um, we work with companies, and collectively the Chain Reaction Project uh, in, in the last four years has brought over 500 participants with us um, on these adventures that we run. And collectively, they've raised now actually over half a million dollars for the five beneficiaries that we work with. Um, and that money has then gone on to impact some 30,000 individuals on the ground. Um, now, if you'd asked me, you know, just five years ago, if I would have seen myself in this position, I would have said no. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew that I wanted to make a difference. And I think my message today is really very simple. I think a lot of times you don't know what you want to do. And because of that, it's so important that along the way, you're doing the best at whatever it is you're doing. It is only now when I look back on my time as a netballer, when I look back at my time running events and marketing at Stan Chart, and writing the news for the Channel News Asia that I realized how many skill sets I've picked up along the way that allow me to be an effective catalyst today. And I'm still learning and I'm still growing. But the point is that it's fine if you don't know what you're doing, but in the meantime, make sure that you're sharpening all these tools, collecting all these different tools to strengthen your toolbox for life. Because when the time comes that you're ready or you've now, you know, sort of been introduced into giving back and where you fit in that picture, you're going to be much more effective if along the way you've been keeping those tools sharpened, okay? So this is where I'm saying for me, the magic happens, you know, is where my passion is married now with my career and giving back. And this will look different for everyone.